All right, so uh, for my first time as hosting one of these micro seminars, uh, from the frigid, it's the coldest, the southwest is the coldest in the country now. So Arizona is apparently the coldest place in the country. So from the frigid southwest, um, I'd like to welcome everybody to micro seminar. Um, first thing, if you've come in, I think everybody has already, but uh, please mute if you're not Laura, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll mute uh, just so you don't hear my background noises here. Um, I'm Dave Baltris. Uh, I think uh, Jen and Cameron are at AGU right now enjoying a fun little randomly timed conference, which is, seems like a weird time to have it to me, but that's awesome. Um, so I get the pleasure of hosting today. Uh, and so today's speaker is going to be Dr. Laura Williams. Uh, currently, she is uh, at Providence College. So she's, a, she's a friar right now. She's been there since last summer. Uh, before that, uh, I know her pretty well through Twitter, um, and we met up at one meeting about a year ago. Um, but before that, Laura was a graduate student at the University of Georgia with Ann Summers, uh, working on an awesome topic of large plasma diversity. That's, that's, uh, love me some large plasmids. Um, and then after that, she was uh, she stayed on as a postdoc in that lab for a little while, and then moved to uh, first uh, MBL to work as a postdoc with Jennifer Warnegreen. Uh, and then moved with Jennifer down to Duke when she was there. Uh, and then after that was a research microbiologist at the USDA uh, back in Athens, Georgia. Uh, so, like I said, since the last since last summer, uh, Laura has been a uh, new PI at Providence College, working with a bunch of undergraduates. And today she's going to talk about predatory bacteria. And the title of her talk is Voracious Smalls. So, yeah, I'm going to mute now. Much. So. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, thanks very much. And um, I'm really excited about this opportunity to talk with you about the research that I've been doing at Providence College. So uh, without further ado, I will just launch into it. If everything works properly, it will be great. There we go. And I'm going to pop up my slides here. And as far as I know, everything is now working, and you can see my slides. But Dave can always flag me down if that's not true. So today, I'm going to be talking about voracious smalls predatory bacteria in the environment. Now, I really wish that I could take credit for that really awesome uh, phrase, voracious smalls. It sounds like an up-and-coming rapper or a really great band name. Um, I did not come up with it, though. I have to credit um, Eduard Yurkovich for that. So he used that term in an essay that he wrote, and I just think it's wonderful. Um, so I'm going to continue to use that and continue to credit him for it because that's great. So these are voracious smalls. They're small bacteria that eat other bacteria. And that's going to be the focus of our time today. But before I get into that, I want to do give you a little bit of background about where I am, because I think I may be the first person to, um, to speak in the series from a primarily undergraduate institution. So I do just want to give you a little bit of background about where I am. I'm at Providence College. We're a primarily undergraduate institution. We have about 3,800 students, 400 of which are biology majors. And this picture here that I'm showing you that's very poorly lit because I took it on my phone um, is a recent conference that we had on campus where it featured the research that undergraduate students did with us and with a couple other people over the summer. Um, so one of the things I love about being here is that there's a really vibrant research culture for undergraduates. So I had four students with me over the summer, and a lot of other faculty have really active research programs that give great opportunities for our undergraduate students. Um, as an aside, if there's anybody out there who's curious about what it's like to be at a PUI, feel free to get in touch with me by Twitter. I'm happy to talk to people about that. Um, and I arrived in, at Providence College actually in January, so I kind of came at the mid-academic year. So everything I'm going to be talking with you about today is really work that we've done since I got here I'd probably say kind of around April, because it took us a while to get the lab up and running. Um, so I think we've made some really great progress, and I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. I'm going to start out by um, acknowledging my really awesome students, because, man, I'm super impressed by them. And uh, we would, you know, me alone, I would get nowhere with this. So I'm really excited to have these students. So I have two crews of people. Today I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the group that's working on predatory bacteria. And these folks are Nadiva Brown, Nicole Cullen, Brett Enos, Sean O'Donnell, and Fabiola Privat. I also have another research track that we just started this fall semester on microbiome work. And that crew is Kyle Edmonds, Lauren Procopio, Justin Ayala, and Claire Kleinschmidt. 
and those last two are kind of co-advised with other faculty here. I'm not going to have a chance to talk about the microbiome project, mainly because we're really getting that going, um, but I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes, and those students are doing a great job. But today we're going to talk primarily about predatory bacteria or voracious smalls. So what are predatory bacteria? You may have heard of some of them before. You may have run across some descriptions of predatory bacteria if you've done any reading about symbiosis or microbial diversity in general. Uh, but if you don't know, predatory bacteria is our kind of general umbrella term for bacteria that eat microbes, primarily other bacteria. So these are bacteria that are acquiring their nutrients by lysing and digesting other microbes. Most of the time this is other bacteria, but there are some predatory bacteria that have lytic activity against um, eukaryotic microbes as well. Um, what we're showing here is just some really great pictures, um, microscope pictures of kind of some typical predatory bacteria, some of the most well-studied ones, where you're basically seeing you've got a, a small predatory cell attaching to a prey cell, and in this case, this particular predator will actually invade that prey cell, replicate to generate new progeny within the prey cell, using the prey cell contents as nutrients to do so, and then that prey cell is going to lyse or burst and release new predatory progeny that then continue the life cycle, go out and hunt for new prey. This is the life cycle of a, a particular predatory bacterium, but in fact there is a quite a wide phylogenetic diversity of predatory bacteria. Just to give you an example of this, there are two particular uh, species of predatory bacteria that have been described from the alpha proteobacteria. And one of this here is Mycovibrio aeruginosivorus, so it eats uh, Pseudomonas aerugino aeruginosa, and it is a obligate predator. So this is a predatory bacterial species that depends on predation in order to sustain itself. Uh, by contrast, within the alpha proteobacteria, we also have a facultative predator called Ensifer adherens. Ensifer is a soil bacterium. It doesn't require predation in order to survive, but it does have a facultative predatory aspect to its lifestyle. And this is a, a, a kind of a two categories that you'll see with predatory bacteria. Some are obligate, some are facultative, and that aspect of their lifestyle, they're not dependent upon preying on other bacteria. We don't just find predatory bacteria in the alpha proteobacteria. There's actually a whole huge range of, of predators that are found in a lot of different bacterial groups. This is a big long list, and there is a really wonderful monograph by um, Yurkovich and Davidov, and they go through in great detail about these various predatory bacteria, how, they're, how they, uh, their different characteristics, where they've been isolated from. And it, the main take-home message of this is really that, if you didn't know this before, predation is, is in fact a lifestyle that has evolved independently multiple times in bacteria. And we can see now from these different isolations that people have done of predatory bacteria from different groups, that we've got kind of a, a, a wide range of phylogenetic diversity when you think about bacteria that prey on other microbes. So we've got the alpha proteobacteria, we've got a lot of facultative predators. So these are a lot of species of, of bacteria that have been seen to prey on other microbes, but as we said, they're not dependent upon it. We do have here, this might be a name that you recognize, Delavibrio. Delavibrio is an obligate predator, it's probably the most well-studied predator. And this is the one that I think people may have run across. We'll come back to it in a little bit to use it as an example for the types of things that we're investigating in our lab. If you've got all of this diversity across bacterial taxonomy in terms of predatory bacteria, this is also reflected in the types of predatory strategies that bacteria can use to prey on other bacteria. And this is a really wonderful drawing that came out of a 2002 paper by Mark Martin where he gives these great examples of kind of four general bacterial predation strategies. So up here in the, in the upper left, the panel A, you have something that's referred to as kind of a wolf pack strategy. 
So this is illustrated by bacterial predators like Myxococcus, which is a facultative predator. The idea here is that the, the predator cells are going to be swarming prey, and they're going to excrete lytic enzymes into the kind of extracellular milieu, and that are, those are going to digest the prey, release the nutrients from the prey cells, and those predatory swarming cells can then use those nutrients in order to grow and divide. Uh, by contrast, these other three strategies involve some aspect of cell-to-cell -cell contact. So if we move to the right and look at panel B, we have an example of what's called an epibiotic lifestyle, and this is illustrated by Mycovibrio and also by a new species of Delavibrio that was recently described called Delavibrio exovorus. In this case, you'll get a predatory cell, which is the smaller cell up at the top, that will actually attach to the outside of a prey cell. Oftentimes, it seems that the common feature is there seems to be some kind of electron-dense material, something that gets formed as sort of a bridge between the predatory cell and the prey cell. And through that, that contact, then the predatory cell can, can start to digest the prey cell and get access again to those nutrients. The bottom two panels are uh, two different strategies that also involve cell-to-cell -cell contact, but have an aspect of the strategy that involves actually invading the prey cell. So on panel C, we've got an example of a direct invasion strategy. And as far as I know, the only predatory bacterium that has been observed to exhibit this strategy is Daptobacter. And in this case, the predatory cell will attach to the outside of the prey cell surface, but then it will actually insert itself and invade all the way into the cytoplasm of the prey cell. It releases lytic enzymes, basically digests the prey cell from the inside, and uses those nutrients in order to grow and divide and generate progeny. So this is a little bit like aliens. You basically end up getting invaded, and then uh, it's the prey cell gets digested and it bursts forth with a lot of new predatory cells. So not so great for the prey cell, but very good for the predator. So in panel D, we have a somewhat similar strategy, but the major difference here is where the predatory cell ends up residing in the prey cell. So this is a paraplasmic strategy where the predatory cell will attach to the prey cell and then it will invade but it will end up residing in the, in the periplasm instead of invading entirely into the cytoplasm. And this is probably the predatory strategy that, that most people may be familiar with because uh, Delavibrio bacteriovorus, which is, uh, I would say, the most well-studied species of predatory bacterium, exhibits this predatory strategy. So it's a periplasmic invader that will enter into the prey cell, sit in the periplasm, digest the prey cell and use that to produce progeny. So these are kind of gives you a sense of in terms of diversity we've got a lot of phylogenetic diversity in predatory bacteria and then we've also got a lot of diversity in terms of predatory strategies. So these aspects of the predatory lifestyle in bacteria make them a really interesting system to think about symbiosis, to think about evolutionary pressures for these different components and proteins that are going to be important for different predation strategies. And this is one of the reasons why I really wanted to get into this system because I think it affords a lot of opportunities to ask interesting questions about the evolution of different bacterial lifestyles. In our lab, we're primarily at this point going to focus on obligate delta proteobacterial predators. So these are predatory bacteria they are obligate predators, so this is an important part of their, of their life cycle. They need to prey on other bacteria in order to, to survive. And they, these tend to belong in the delta proteobacteria. And we kind of picked this because, as I've been saying, this is probably the most well understood group of predatory bacteria. So these are found in a wide range of environments. A lot of people have looked in a whole range of different kind of habitats and niches to try to figure out, can you find these delta proteobacterial predators here? And it seems like, yes, you can. So they've been isolated from sewage, from soil, from marine environments, estuary environments, from different environments that, you, you know, that have extreme kind of environmental challenges, such as high levels of different metals. 
um, high levels of certain pollutants, you can find these types of predatory bacteria in those environments. So that's a really interesting aspect that they, you know, a couple people will use the word ubiquitous, which, uh, um, you know, there are places you probably can't find them, but they sure seem to show up in a lot of different environments. This group of predators seems to specialize on gram-negative prey. As far as I know, I don't think there's been any of these particular predators described that will prey on gram-positive bacteria. So it looks like these particular, this particular group is a specialist for gram-negative prey. There's been a bit of kind of taxonomy shifting um, as happens with bacteria. And so I just want to give you a little bit of a, of a, of a survey of what are the different kind of genera that we're, we're going to be looking at in our lab and trying to isolate out of different environments. So here is Della Vibrio with the Della Vibrio bacteria vorus. As we mentioned, this is a periplasmic predator. As far as I know and as far as I've seen described, I don't think there are any marine isolates that are assigned to this particular species. These tend to be uh, terrestrial and you can find them also in freshwater. Della Vibrio exovorus was, as I mentioned, a recently described Della Vibrio that is an epibiotic predator. So that's a really neat opportunity to compare the evolution of predatory strategy within the same genus. We also have Bacteriovorax and Peretobacter. These are paraplasmic predators and they tend to be terrestrial. So you can find them in terrestrial environments. I believe there might have been a freshwater isolate or two in this as well. And then we have a group called Halobacteriovorax. So this is a newly introduced name, and this is meant to kind of uh, define this cluster of predatory bacteria that are particularly uh, found in saltwater environments. So Halobacteriovorax is going to be coming from marine and estuary environments, and it's also a paraplasmic predator. This is just meant to kind of give you a sense of, in our lab, what we're aiming to try to isolate out of environmental sites. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a more detailed look at the life cycle of Della Vibrio bacteriovorus, mainly because it's just really neat, and also because it gives you a sense of what are we looking for when we're going to do microscopy for our isolations. And so essentially what we can do for this life cycle is if we start out here on the left, we've got what's called the free-swimming Della Vibrio in attack phase. These are small cells, they're flagellated, they swim incredibly rapidly, and they're basically in, as they said, kind of a hunting phase, an attack phase, where they're looking for prey to attach to and then digest. So when a predatory, a predatory cell, a predatory Della Vibrio encounters a prey cell, there's going to be attachment to the outside of the prey cell, and then the process of invasion happens where the predatory Della Vibrio will enter into the prey periplasm. There's an interesting feature of the life cycle here where when that predator ends up in the periplasm, it actually prompts some changes to the peptidoglycan layer to the cell wall and the cell membranes of the prey. So a normally rod-shaped prey cell will start to form this rounded spherical structure and that's called a deloplast. So there's some indication that the entrance of the predator into the prey cell prompts some structural changes that changes the conformation of the prey cell. There's also some indication that this may make it much more difficult for another predator to enter into that prey cell. So uh, in my mind, I think there's an interesting opportunity to look at kind of cooperation and competition in terms of the fact that this particular strategy, you end up with predator cells that are almost in competition with each other because once one of them gets into a prey cell, they can kind of seal it behind themselves and prevent their, their conspecific cells from getting into that cell. So once you have the formation of the deloplast, you get filamentous growth of that original predator cell. So it's releasing lytic enzymes, it's digesting the contents of the prey cell, it's using those as nutrients in order to to kind of continue to grow, to continue to produce um, more cellular components. It lengthens into a filament and then what will happen is it will actually septate into new progeny. Those new progeny will have flagella and that deloplast will then lyse 
and that those new progeny will be released from the deloplast and they will enter back into the attack phase where they can complete the cycle and go on the hunt for new prey to attack. So I wanted to, if I can, pop out really quick. Hopefully this is still working. I will show you this really great video that came from Elizabeth Socket's lab in the University of Nottingham. And they did this wonderful job where they were able to get an E. coli prey cell, pretty sure that's E. coli, to uh, fluoresce. And so by doing that, you can see the contrast between the prey cell and the predator as it's kind of lengthening and then dividing after invading it. So I'll just go ahead and play this. There's a bit of narration, but I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear it. So there's that Della Vibrio predator. There's the E. coli that's fluorescing. And when they start it, you're going to be able to see that cell lengthening as it digests the prey cell contents. And then in this case, you can see it septate into five new predator cells. And once it lyses, it basically gets quenched. And you, that's the point at which uh, the new progeny are released. So that's, in my mind, I, I think that's just a, an extraordinary feat of microscopy that they got that captured. Uh, this, these are, you know, small cells and the time lapse and fluorescence, and it's just a beautiful illustration of how incredible this, this predatory life cycle is. Um, that's a bit of background on predatory bacteria in general. And kind of what we want to give you just before I launch into the data is, you know, this is all very interesting, but why are, are we studying this? From a theoretical standpoint, as I mentioned, there I think there are a ton of amazing questions you can ask about the evolution of bacterial lifestyle, that you can ask about the uh, selective pressures on particular um, proteins and particular pathways that are involved with predation. You can ask questions about predation versus, um, you know, mutualistic interactions and pathogenicity. So from a theoretical standpoint, I think there's a lot to, uh, to get at with this particular system. From a practical standpoint, just as you would, you know, just as is the case with bacteriophage, there is some interest in whether or not predatory bacteria can be developed as biocontrol agents. Uh, DARPA is funding some research into this. And there's been, as I'm showing here, there's a couple of citations where people have done some preliminary studies looking at can you in fact use predatory bacteria as a way to, as an, as an alternative to antibiotics, basically. So we have a lot of problems with antibiotic resistance. People are looking at using bacteriophage as a potential alternative treatment. Predatory bacteria fall in line with that as well. Um, and so these two groups did some work to try to see if you could use predatory bacteria to control um, corneal infections or eye infections. And then Liz Socket's group actually looked at whether or not you can reduce the load of salmonella in, a, in poultry rearing by the administration of, of Della Vibrio bacteria voris. And in both cases, these, these looked very promising. So our interest in this system is both theoretical and it's also practical because we're kind of thinking that, you know, if we can contribute to the development of some complementary treatments or alternative treatments to antibiotics, that's something that's uh, becoming even more important as we learn more about antibiotic resistance. So with that in mind, our lab launched into the uh, study of some of these predatory bacteria. So we really got going, as I said, in April. And our first goal was to get our hands on some isolates from local environments. We really wanted to be working with new isolates. We wanted to be working with isolates that we could potentially have access to the sampling sites if we wanted to ask some long-term questions. And so that's what we started out with. And the very first step for us is to try to isolate some potential prey. Um, we chose to use prey from the same sites that we wanted to sample because we thought that would increase our chances of getting some interesting new predators, so maybe not isolating the same things that you might get if you were using like a standard E. coli. And we also wanted to just kind of get a sense of what the variety of different environmental sites in terms of the distribution and the, and the difference in predatory bacteria at different sites. So my students picked three sites. They decided to, I had one student do each type of site. So we have an estuary site, a freshwater site, and a soil site. 
And then they basically went about the task of isolating environmental bacteria. So this is something that I think people do in the you know, standard microbiology labs across the country. Um, and they did spread plates of all their samples. We had them do a membrane filter technique for their water samples, which we're just showing a picture of there so that they can get some uh, isolates out of the water. And once they got those, they basically did your standard streak plates to obtain single colonies. So we did three rounds of those to get pure environmental bacterial isolates. Um, as an aside, I'm showing a McConkie auger plate here that uh, one of my students did. So one of my students decided to isolate from soil. And when she did her first round, she basically just got all bacillus. So it was just we were just awash in bacillus. And she thought, well, this isn't going to help because I'm pretty sure I need gram-negative prey. So she went the McConkie auger route, and that was much more successful. But um, if you study bacillus and you want some soil bacillus isolates, we have got some for you. So <laughs> feel free to get in touch with us. Um, so after doing all of this, we ended up with a panel of potential prey isolates. Um, and they went ahead and took this through 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing so we could get a sense of what do we have that could serve as potential prey for isolating a predator. So this is basically the bait for trying to get our hands on predators. Um, we have a lot of marine vibrio, so that's uh, from our estuary site. We've got a few interesting isolates from our freshwater site, um, one of which does not terrifically, this, this return from um, RDP was uh, a little bit low confidence, so we're pretty sure it's somewhere in the, in, with these here. Um, and then we've got some good serratia and pseudomonas from our soil, which is really what we wanted because we know that those tend to be pretty good uh, prey for soil predatory bacteria. So this gives us a panel of prey bacteria to use as bait, and then we're going to use those to go after our predators. Um, again, these are pretty standard microbiological techniques, so that's one of the things I like about this project is because it gets the students doing wet lab work that is uh, good quality microbiology work. So you can start out by doing an enrichment. You basically combine the sample, so if it's a water sample or if it's soil, we basically do some centrifugations and get the uh, supernatant from the soil. You combine that sample with about 10 to the 9th CFU per mil of potential prey. So you basically load that sample with what you think is a good potential prey to isolate a predator. And then you let that incubate at an optimum temperature. It tends to be lower for the marine predators and a little bit maybe around 28 or 30 for the soil and the freshwater. And then you do a double auger overlay technique. So you take that enrichment, do a serial dilution, plate it out on, um, in soft top auger with a prey lawn. This is a very similar to bacteriophage, so there's a lot of kind of shared techniques with how you would isolate bacteriophage. You end up with these clearances in the, in the prey lawn, and then you can pick a single plaque, add it to a flask with the same prey, and you want to check to make sure you've got fast-moving predatory cells that are attached to prey cells. So this is a picture of, um, this is a standard type strain, Delavibrio bacteriovorus HD100, that's attached to an E. coli cell. And this helps you make sure that you're getting predatory cells and not phage, because you could expect to isolate phage from your environment. They'd form plaques just the same as predators. So you need a way to be able to tell the difference between the two. And microscopy lets you detect that you've got these small, fast-moving predatory cells that are attaching to your prey. If you see that, then basically you've got to get a pure isolate of it, so you want to repeat the double auger overlay two more times so that you can get a pure isolate. That's the basic workflow that all my students went through, which takes a bit of time because sometimes it takes eight to ten days for the plaques to come up. They're a bit slower to grow than particularly when you see with phage. So it's, sometimes it's a lot of waiting to see if it worked or not, and if it didn't work, you got to back all the way up again and spend another eight to ten days watching your plates. Uh, so it can take a little bit of time, uh, but in the end, this is the best way to make sure you've got a pure isolate of predatory bacteria. So using this process, we attempted isolation of predatory bacteria from four different environments. We've already talked a little bit about sampling from freshwater, estuary, and soil for prey bacteria. The built environment, I'm going to talk about that at the end because that's some of our more kind of puzzling results. Um, that'll be an interesting, uh, an interesting tidbit there. So to start with our freshwater, 
So this was uh, work done by Sean O'Donnell. And he uh, started out sampling from his stream site where he got his potential prey bacteria. And he basically couldn't, he couldn't get anything uh, in terms of isolating a predator. So we backed up and we said, look, let's just see if we can figure out just by PCR if there's anything at the sites that you want to sample. And so he did a Della Vibrio specific PCR with genomic DNA he extracted from water samples. So he had three different sites that he looked at, his original stream site, and then a reservoir up the road, and then a pond that's part of a state park that's a, a bit north of us. And basically what he found was the stream and the reservoir were negative by PCR for Della Vibrio. Now, um, you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, so it could be that they're there, but they're not showing up in the kinds of numbers that are going to make it easy for us to get a hold of. Strangely, the only pond, the state park site, he got <laughs> flummoxing results, basically. Um, he got PCR results that suggested there might be a transient or maybe a fluctuating population of Della Vibrio there. So he would, he would sample, he would get a PCR hit, he couldn't get a predator out of it, he would go back and sample again, the PCR hit would be negative. He'd go back and sample again, the PCR hit would be positive. So um, it was basically teasing him. And, uh, and we, we, we didn't really manage to get a hold of an actual predatory isolate from our freshwater sites. So that was kind of uh, Sean's fall semester, is trying to fight with both his sampling site and PCR. And we're still kind of working to see what are the ideal conditions for getting a predator out of a particular freshwater site. The estuary site, and this is work done by Brett Enos, the estuary site uh, behaved a little bit better. So our estuary site is in Mount Hope Bay, so that's a kind of east of Bristol, south of Warren, Rhode Island. Um, and here is a picture of his site. And he uh, had a lot more success trying to visualize or, or uh, view predators from that site. So early on in his tests, he was seeing really great things. For instance, he got uh, good microscope pictures of deloplast formation. So this was an early enrichment test that he did where he actually managed to get in, in his field and he managed to capture over the course of time attachment of a predator to a prey cell and then invasion so you can see it forming that rounded deloplast structure that I mentioned when we talked about the life cycle and you can still see there might be just a little bit of the predator left there and then it forms this perfectly round deloplast structure. So Brett managed to capture this by microscopy in one of his early tests, which told us that we were on the right track in terms of using this site to get an estuary predatory isolate. So what Brett had to do then was test a bunch of his potential prey and also to test media conditions. This is a um, kind of a saltwater site. So that meant that what Brett learned was that the regular media we were using for our other predatory bacteria and our kind of wild type Della Vibrio bacteriovorus was not going to work for this estuary site. So we did a lot of casting around trying to figure out how to make instant ocean, how to autoclave instant ocean or not, how to uh, get the particular peptone minimal medium that he needed. So he spent, he spent a good amount of time troubleshooting media conditions and he finally got a combination that worked for him. And he also finally found a, one of his predators that seemed to be working particular, or one of his prey that seemed to be working particularly well as bait to pull out a predator. So that's this particular Vibrio strain. It's a marine Vibrio. You know, this is the species identification by blasts. I mean, take that with a grain of salt because it's blast. But, you know, we're pretty confident that this is a marine Vibrio, which is a good candidate prey for isolating a predator from this estuary. So using that particular prey species, Brett has uh, gotten his pure isolate of a marine predatory bacterium. Now the thing that we noticed with this one is that these cells, these predatory cells that he's got are tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, predatory bacteria are typically small. These are vanishingly small. Um, it's hard to actually catch them on the, to take a good image when you've got a still frame. If you're looking at it live under the microscope, you can just see these tiny predatory cells just zip across the field of vision, which is pretty impressive how fast they are. And then when they attach, the, there's a tendency for the prey to kind of rotate around a little bit 
I think possibly as a result of the of the attachment of the predator, and that makes it incredibly difficult to, difficult to actually catch a good picture of them. Um, but Brett managed to do that, so there's a super tiny predatory cell there, and then there's what looks like two super tiny predatory cells attaching in the bottom panel. And more importantly, what he's got is the double auger overlay technique, he's got plaque formation, he was able to get this through three rounds, so what we have right now is uh, a pure isolate of a predatory bacterium from the estuary. Um, he's working on doing 16S identification, we're not sure what it is yet, but our operating hypothesis is that he's probably got something from that Halobacteria vorax family that I mentioned a bit earlier. So it's get, we think it's going to be a paraplasmic predator, we think it's probably going to be in the Halobacteria vorax family, but we're not sure yet because he's still working on that. So our soil system, that was our uh, third environment that we wanted to try to get a predatory bacterium from. And in fact, we have this neat opportunity on campus to work with a, a bioswale system. So Providence College, as part of their uh, wastewater management or stormwater management system, has installed a number of different bioswale systems across campus. This one that I'm showing you here, the pictures of from July 2014 and then just a, a month or so ago in October, is right outside of our building. It catches uh, stormwater runoff from the roof of a nearby building that was recently constructed, and it sends it through kind of, uh, I think it's three or four different cells that that water then runs through in order to filter it and kind of control what happens to the runoff into the street and into the stormwater system. Um, so Nicole uh, Cullen decided that she wanted to try to sample uh, some soil sites around campus. She chose a couple of different sites and in the end this bioswale was the one that gave her the best um, PCR hit in terms of suggesting there was Delavibrio there. So Nicole went through the whole process uh, that we discussed about how to get her hands on a predatory bacterium from that bioswale and she has been successful in doing that. She's got an isolate that as far as we know right now will lyse both her serratia and her Pseudomonas species. So those were her four isolates that she got from, from soil as potential prey bacteria belonged to Serratia and Pseudomonas. And as far as we can tell, it looks like this particular predator from the bioswale will attack and digest both of those. So her microscope picture here shows the Pseudomonas prey, and then you've got these very small predatory bacteria. And you can also kind of see here, there's a few of them that are just free uh, not attached to anything. And they've got that traditional kind of little comma shape that we see that's typical of Delavibrio bacteria boris. So Nicole also got her uh, plaque plates, so her predatory bacterium forms nice plaques in that double auger overlay technique. She has gotten some 16S ribosomal RNA data back. We just got this back on Monday, so Nicole has not had a chance to assemble it yet. Um, I could have done it, but I would like her to do it. So, uh, so this is where we are with this. Um, we've got her forward read and her reverse read, and we just blasted them uh, to get a sense of what she's got. And it looks like she has Delavibrio bacteria voris. That's what we expected based on what we could see from the microscope. Um, but it looks like it's going to have some very interesting differences since it's only about 96% identical or 95% depending um, to bacteria vorus strains that have been sequenced. Um, so we've, we are really excited about this because we think that this particular isolate is going to give us some great opportunities to look at kind of differences between what's already been described in sequence and the isolate that Nicole's got her hands on. Um, we've got another opportunity with this because there is uh, multiple bioswale systems on campus. We're now thinking about what we can do to kind of have an interesting long-term experiment looking at the distribution of predatory bacteria in these bioswale systems. We might get a new one because we've got some new construction going on on campus. And I have a colleague, uh, assistant professor, who was hired around the same time I was, Jonathan Richardson. He's an evolutionary ecologist, and he and his students are collecting water retention and water quality data from these bioswale systems there's a nice opportunity to collaborate with him and kind of partner some of his hydrology data with some explorations of how the predatory bacteria population changes with these bioswale systems. So our fourth and final 
environment that we looked at was the built environment. And I can't take any credit for this at all because uh, this was Nadiva Brown's idea. Nadiva came to work with me in the spring and over the summer and Nadiva said, I want to know if predatory bacteria are on surfaces. And I said, well, Nadiva, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't read too much about that. She said, well, I want to know. I said, all right, just, you know, let's do it. And so Nadiva swabbed a bunch of surfaces. She went on a swabbing expedition multiple times and she picked things that seemed likely to probably have biofilms. That was kind of the criteria we were trying to use in terms of we need to find a surface that probably has a thriving population of, of potential prey for these predators to eat if we expect to find them. So she did things like shower curtains, sinks, windows, things that might have moisture, door handles, and then I, I'm honestly not sure why it struck her to do this, but she also swabbed our deionized water system that our department uses. And she did genomic DNA extraction from the swabs, did a Delavirio specific PCR, and pretty much got blanks, uh, except for she saw something on a light pole that was outdoors, which makes sense because that's an outdoor environment. And she also had a really faint PCR band for the deionized water hose, which kind of made me pause and say, um, okay, that's interesting. We're going to have to confirm that. So. Here's our deionized water system, which probably looks quite a bit like everybody else's. Um, what we've got is we've basically got our different filters, and then there's this hose that I was talking about was basically the outlet hose that comes down from um, the filtering system and dumps into a, a, a drain down here. It's not the hose that we actually get our deionized water from, fortunately, because otherwise I would have had some bad news for people at faculty meeting, like, hmm, we should look at our DI water system. But it's actually the outlet hose that Nadiva was sampling, and then she that's what she got her hit from. So to follow up on that, we decided, well, let's look into this in more detail. So what we did was we swabbed the drain down here that the hose drains into, and we swabbed the hose again. And then one of my students, Sean, actually took a water sample from the hose itself. So he took the uh, like a 500 mils of the outflow from the DI water system. We did genomic DNA extractions of the swabs and of the water. And basically what we're getting back is some independent confirmation that there's something going on in terms of a population of Della Vibrio potentially um, in this DI kind of the, in the drain system or in the outlet hose system. So this is a, a beautiful gel from Fabiola Privat. And she's showing a strong band and the drain from the drain swab. And then Sean. O'Donnell did the water sample extraction and then he's getting kind of a faint band, but you can see it, of the hose water. So it's funny to us because I don't know if you remember that Sean O'Donnell was the student of mine who did his freshwater sites. So he had picked freshwater as his environment and he went traipsing around Rhode Island trying to find freshwater sites that might have Della Vibrio and it didn't work out for him and apparently he could have walked 15 feet to the DI water cabinet that's down the hall from us to in order to try to isolate a predatory bacterium from uh, the DI water. So this is a particularly interesting finding. Um, Fabiola is going to take over on this in the spring and try to figure out if she can actually, for our future work, get her hands on a predatory bacterial isolate from that system. So seeing evidence of a predatory bacterium by PCR is one thing. We actually want to get our hands on a, uh, an isolate. We want to see if we can get an isolate out of that to try to understand what's exactly going on. Is it a biofilm that's colonizing the hose and then dumping into the drain? Is it a biofilm that's colonizing the drain? So this is a, you know, I mean, this all comes from Nadiva's original idea of trying to understand if there is some system with built environments that predatory bacteria are able to kind of thrive in. Um, and we're going to follow up on this because I think it's a really interesting finding in terms of thinking about how predatory bacteria are interacting with biofilms and how they might um, be part of the built environment's microbial communities. So that's our goals for the built environment site. For the estuary and the bioswale, since we have our hands on pure isolates of predatory bacteria, now we get to get into all the, the great nitty gritty stuff. So for the spring we've got, and the summer coming up, we've got some uh, great plans to do electron microscopy. One of the things we want to know is, are these predatory isolates 
paraplasmic invaders, or do they perhaps invade the cytoplasm? We've seen attachment by microscopy, by phase contrast microscopy, so, and then we've seen deloplast formation, so we've seen the rounded cells. That tells us that it's not an epibiotic predator. We're pretty sure it's invading, but we don't know until we can see by microscopy if it's going to reside in the, in the periplasm. That's our expectation, but we can't discount the fact that it could be that these go into the cytoplasm. I really doubt it because that's not observed very often, but we want to get some confirmation by microscopy. We're also going to start looking at prey range. We've, done, we've begun this a little bit with Nicole's soil isolate from the bioswale, so we know that it will attack and digest serratia and pseudomonas. But we have a whole nice panel of potential prey that, that the students isolated from their environments. And what we want to do is start challenging these predatory isolates with those prey species to understand if these are generalists or if these are specialists. Um, so we'll be challenging the soil isolate with the freshwater samples or the freshwater prey that Sean isolated. Brett's going to be looking at whether or not his marine estuary isolate can attack all of those marine vibrio that he managed to get out of his Mount Hope Bay site. We're also going to be looking at predation efficiency. So following up on the question of what's the prey range, you can also ask a new level of that, which is for a particular prey species, how efficient is this isolate in killing it? Um, there's a luminescence assay that's been described that we may try um, to get a sense of how efficient these different predatory isolates are. I also want to do some experimental evolution, and this pulls in some of the things that I've been doing with my uh, PhD and my postdoc, and I want to combine that with some genome sequencing because really what we want to get at is understanding the molecular evolution of things like the lytic enzymes and the different uh, aspects of the predatory life cycle and the components, the cellular components that make those aspects possible. So we really want to get a sense of can we uh, get a generalist to start to specialize on a particular prey species? Can we get a specialist to become more of a generalist? Um, and so there's a few experiments we want to try in which we challenge these isolates with different prey and then look at their molecular evolution over different time points. That's my uh, long-term plan since I just got here, and we're going to start working on that in the spring and over the summer. So hopefully in a year or so, I'll have some of these knocked off the list, and we'll get uh, a lot more data on these particular predatory bacteria that we've isolated from Rhode Island. So I do want to acknowledge that um, I've been very fortunate to have great support for the research program that I've started up here. So we have an inbrae. Uh, for Rhode Island, and that's been incredibly helpful. They funded three of my students over the summer. The Providence College Biology Department funded a fourth student, and so that was really wonderful to be able to have all four with me. And I do want to acknowledge people who've what I call much appreciated advice and assistance. It's really hard to make it just on your own, and so I've got some great colleagues at Providence College who've been very tolerant of me stealing things out of their labs, and then they don't know where it is. I probably have it. Um, I've had people who've been very kind to send me strains, um, Dan Kaduri and Mark Martin. Also, Mark Martin has been a, a wonderful source of advice for predatory bacteria. Um, Jim McElvain with Zeiss was very helpful with us for microscopy. And then Liz Socket has, and uh, Henry Williams have also been really helpful in terms of uh, their work with predatory bacteria and advice that they've given me. And last but not least, I really do want to thank Twitter because I have at times posted some uh, questions to Twitter that are much like, you know, how do you make instant ocean? And people have been very uh, helpful to respond to that when they really don't have to. So Twitter's been a wonderful network for me in terms of getting some answers to some of these questions we're generating. But I'm really excited about this research program. I'm really looking forward to continuing on with these students and discovering more about these isolates that we've uncovered. And at this point, I think I'll end, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, cool. Thank you very much. I was see you worried about going too short. And I think you're still muted. Am I still muted? You're muted. I am? Are you? Oh, I'm not. I'm muted. <laughs> that was uh, me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I have to turn my volume up. Um, I see you're worried about going too short, and that was perfect. So. <laughs> oh, good. Yay. Um, I have a couple questions, but John Badalamenti has a question about, uh, so 
He's asking if when you, you think when you sequence the predatory bacteria, you think you'll get the prey genome coming along too, and is that going to be a problem, or is that, uh, are they too digested at that point? Yeah, um, I think there's a chance of that. So uh, there's a couple strategies. One is the way we got our 16S data back for that soil isolate, we basically took a, a lysate of, um, you have the prey bacteria growing in a flask. It's minimal medium, so you're not really supplying any nutrients but that. You add the predatory isolate, you let that grow up for a while, and then you can send that through a bunch of uh, basically 0.45 micron filters. So you're pulling the predator away from the prey, um, and then you prep the genomic DNA. The 16S data that we got doing that came back pretty clean. So there wasn't any evidence of the prey 16S gene when we did that. That wasn't true for the marine isolate, which is partially why Brett doesn't have any data for the 16S, because he got basically his prey back. Um, so that can be an issue. If we will probably do the filtration, and then if we send it off for sequencing, my plan is to do pack bio sequencing. And I'm really thinking that with the length of reads that they're getting, I would anticipate that if there is prey bacteria and there's prey bacterial uh, genomic DNA data returned, I'm thinking it's going to fall out in the in the assembly. I don't anticipate it's going to be an enormous problem. Or you can just write a paper showing that 20% of the genome is horizontal transfer. <laughs> I'll just let me write that down. <laughs> um, yeah, so a couple questions I got. Uh, so what's the? I know some of these guys are pretty specialist, right? Like, what's the range of generalist to specialist that you're looking at here? You know, uh, the what what I see when what, when people do prey range studies, they end up describing. For instance, Della Vibrio is described as a as kind of a host generalist um, within gram negative prey. So it really doesn't seem like these particular Della Vibrio are attacking gram positives. There are some predatory bacteria that do, but um, within this uh, Delta proteobacterial family, it seems like they specialize in gram negative. But Della Vibrio bacteriovorus seems to attack all kinds of things. Um, and then the Microvibrio, there's a paper where they looked at prey range, and I think it was something like 60 out of the 87 bacteria they tried, Microvibrio would attack and digest. They just um, have use aeroginosa as the first one, and that's why they... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys. So I, I think the tendency is for them to be generalists. Um, but, again, this is a m small number of isolates that people are actually working with, which is why we wanted to go out and get our own, so we can start to say, like, is that truly, you know, does it truly seem like they're generalists, or can we find some that seem to be specializing in particular uh, groups of bacterial prey? Uh, and then I was in, so what's the deal with the ones that lice the microbial eukaryotes? Like yeah, there's a couple that have been described that um, it just looks like, I think it's because they have a wolf pack method, so they're secreting a lot of lytic enzymes, and I just, my impression um, from the small number of studies that have been done with those is that those lytic enzymes are just effective enough that they're going to destroy anything in their path, basically. Uh, but those outside of Della Vibrio, and Mycovibrio, the rest of the predatory bacteria that have been described, there's just spotty kind of studies of exactly what they're doing and exactly how they, they have, what their predatory strategy is. Um, so that was one of those things that was like, I ran across it and it was really tantalizing, but then it was like, that's it, that's all we've got, is it probably kills fungi. Like, what? It does? Like, what, what, what does that mean? But I think there's just not a lot done with those. Cool. Um, I'm looking through. So I don't see uh, anybody want to chime in. Anybody that's muted or looking want to chime in at all? Or are you guys good? All right. I will take that silence as a <laughs> um, good job. That was awesome. Uh, all right. I'm going to thank you very much, and I will stop. Yeah, thank you. And we'll, uh, yeah, see how that goes. So should be...